Hello, Chaos TV. This is Nick Robertson from Mayhem. Okay, so what's up, everyone? Today, Chaos TV is here at Tavastia Club, and we have Necro Butcher from Mayhem as guest. So, first of all, hello and welcome to Finland, man, once again. Thank you. Always a pleasure to come back to Finland. It's uh, even uh, sometimes su surprising to me uh, that you guys always want us back again and again and again and again, and uh, sometimes several times in the year. So. Uh, But uh, since we always always pack the houses and everybody's happy, uh, this is one of the best countries for Mayhem. And uh, whenever we release any albums, uh, it's only three charts we jump into, and that's the Norwegian, the Polish, and the Finnish. And I guess probably because you guys listening to uh, heavy metal music more than, let's say, Other countries. So you also end up in Norwegian charts when you release new music, and that you are like big in your home country as well. Uh, yeah, we uh, we jump into the lists. We have never been number one, but I think the both, both Dimmeborger and uh, Satyricon has been number one. Okay. And I believe over here, I think that the him and uh, some of these other. Uh, Metal bands with female vocals. Uh, I never remember the name. Uh, Nightwish. Nightwish, right? I guess they jump to number one when yeah, they, they release. are always one when they release new yeah. music. The same with Behemoth in uh, in uh, in uh, Poland. I think they also reach number one in the Polish charts. But uh, good news from Germany, ladies and gentlemen. We just jumped into j uh, position 15 on their national charts and they only listen to oompa oompa music so that's, <laughs> that's good uh, for a black metal band yeah so something is going on so speaking about now you have been on the road with diamond for a while and so in general what kind of feedback have you gotten from the fans you have played like four new songs live on the set yeah, yeah. <clears throat> when you release an album and nobody heard and the, <clears throat> the timing wasn't completely on our side this time we had some problem with the printing so actually the physical copy came out 8th of uh, November and that was like uh, almost two weeks after we started the tour which was not ideal uh, it was out on the streaming the 25th of uh, October so uh, it was released but not really properly released but Enough people had heard it, and uh, we have sold out most of the shows we did in Europe. Uh, I think that, I mean, it's great to announce that you sell out, but uh, it also means that you're in the wrong club. Yeah, yeah, you should play bigger venues then. So, speaking about the album, you, you probably hear from every journalist that they compare it to Do The Mystery Storm Satanas. That there has been like quite a lot of comparison to that specific album, which is obviously your like most classic album to date. So you played the album through. So did that affect this album somehow, or how do you see it yourself? Yeah, it's uh, like you said. We have just finished about 200 uh, concerts with uh, Mr. Stop Satanas played in full over the last three years. Yeah. And um, I'm sure of that some of that has bled into the songwriting of the two guitarists that write music for Mayhem, Gul and Telok. Uh, I, I have overheard them saying that in interviews themselves, that uh, th there is some, some kind of leakage in between these albums. Um, so, but I, I mean, one thing was that the, the decision to do the tour in the first place was that some uh, some people in the band thought that that was our jewel and should be saved. But I was on the other uh, impression that we need to to get our gold out now. Worldwide, 
and then take it from there instead of waiting. And I think actually that strategy worked very, very well because now after the Mysterious, suddenly everything turned to gold. We sell out all the venues, we hit the charts, record companies in the roof of ecstasy. Yeah, and people uh, really seem to like the new album. Only thing I'm pissed off is that they underestimated the, the vinyls and stuff, so they printed too little, but I mean, that's a luxury problem. <laughs> that's something that black metal bands shouldn't think about even, or...? Well, no, they should always think about that, because black metal is the best. So, speaking about the album itself, you also did some lyric writing to it. As everybody knows, anything about Mayhem knows that I wrote all the lyrics in the 90s. The Pure Fucking Armageddon, Carnage, Chains of Guts, Fuck, Necrolus, Death Crush. And I wrote also Curse in Eternity, who are on the Mysterious Tom Satanas album. Okay. After that, everything turned into concepts. Like with Wolves yeah. Abyss, Grand Decoration of War and Chimera are concepts and I had lyrics but they didn't fit into my next concept. Okay. Uh, don't know if that's uh, 100% correct or if he just wanted it for himself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also Ordo at KO and Estor Warfare was also kind of concept albums or pretty much actually concept albums and it didn't really fit because I didn't have any ideas that would fit into that concept so when this album was in the making I told the guys that I have some ideas and they said well you know write some lyrics and see what you can come up with and so I've been writing lyrics all summer and came up four or five lyrics that I thought was kind of cool and but when I presented it to the band It was already too late in the process, and there was only one track left okay. to put my track on, and that became Bad Blood. Also, the, the lyric is called Bad Blood, but that, the song is called Bad Blood. It's written by Gul. Uh, so um, I'm luckily, I was happy. I was happy that after all these years, that I also now contrib- contributing on the uh, on the uh, musical and lyrical aspects. So do you feel that that's what, like, also one of the reasons that, that this album is compared to the mysteries that you are like more involved as a band to this than on the previous couple of albums, where there's actually been like only one main songwriter? Yeah, and also that. Uh, not only that, I actually, you know, these days we don't team up in the studio and are there for four weeks. Uh, we do it, we, we shop it up and uh, do like four for example four different takes four or five different takes in four or five different studios and then put it together so we're not even together anymore while recording okay we rehearse of course but while recording it's seldom that we are in the studio but on this album I'm I'm ki- I'm uh, doing the bass on one of the songs and uh, and I could feel Hellhammer's drums like and I started to play on pick on his uh, on his uh, drum beat because that's what I do live yeah. you know we we play the song but where it where on the scale it is but sometimes I I kick back and not necessarily change it but just because of the drums suddenly come in the double double uh, kick drum for example so that's you know that's uh, so when we did this in the studio and Telok was my uh, technician so and we just did it and I told him hey was that cool enough you know Well, uh, or should we go for the the whole technical thing? And he said, "Well, fuck that. That sounded cool." And that, and then after a while, into the recording, sometimes it's it felt live. Yeah, it felt like a live recording session with all the members on board when listening back to it. And I think that's the best um, possible outcome for for a record that it actually sounds live. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you that, that. That was that the goal when you started writing it? That you want those songs 
to be good live instead of just those studio versions which you can hear from the CD, but they are almost impossible to turn into live situations. Yeah, absolutely. Especially now since the two last albums were very mathematically put together and, uh, and uh, they were hard to re reconstruct live. That now, listening back to this new album, I'm thinking to myself, wow, we can easily reproduce the whole album. And there's like, we have eight favorite tracks. Uh, we play four of them now. Uh, but my favorite track is not even in the set. So Not yet. Not yet, that's right. Okay, so you will probably be switching those songs later on to the set. That's the plan. We switch over and towards the US set, we will uh, switch out a couple of them and then we will then come back to Europe again next uh, September uh for another line nightline tour um and then we will see if we switch out which one we switched out who worked the better yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe yeah, yeah and even maybe even include uh, one more song you know maybe why why not play five songs yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh in the beginning you know before people really have heard the album it's it's cool that we uh or i think that's better because if I, as a fan, go to a gig with, a, with even my favorite bands and I haven't heard half of the set, it kind of, it doesn't give me the best feeling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, because then you would be waiting for your favorite songs or the songs you know in between. But three songs of the new album is, you know, the, and if it's your favorite uh, uh, favorite musicians, you know, there is some good in it and you can, you can, enjoy those three songs but i mean if it was a lot then it would maybe be a lot to take in especially in this kind of extreme music too you know it's a lot of things going on it's fast yeah, yeah. and stuff too so i guess you are also a band that your fans are so die hard that they want to hear those specific songs each night i guess they are pretty hard to please or <laughs> even impossible to please yeah, I read an interview with uh, Keith Rickards here the other day and he said to me, he's so sick and tired of playing Satisfaction and let's spend the night together. That, uh, But he loves his fans yeah, so yeah. much and he, can, he looks at his fans and when he's playing these songs that people start to cry and stuff. And I actually experienced that myself, that uh, sometimes I look into the audience and I can see this older guy with beard and stuff and yeah. trying to clean his glasses, yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. he's not cleaning his glasses, he's fucking crying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then again, I must admit that I'm I'm one of those guys that can go to concert and if this special track comes uh, that has been used in a funeral or that I have some emotions, extra emotions yeah, too, yeah. that I have to go back in the hall and <laughs> hide a little tear myself. <laughs> but I guess good, it's a good thing that music kind of like gives you those reactions. Then you have done something correct. Yeah, well, music has been uh, my whole life. Uh, I, re I relate everything to music, everything. And I have music for every occasion, I'm always listening to music. Yeah listening to the music when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm doing uh, my sports, when I'm, uh, before I go to bed, immediately when I get out of bed, for breakfast, for dinner. Yeah. And it's different type of music for everything. I have car music, for example, I like to listen to CC Top. Okay, good yeah. band. Yeah, it is a good band, but only in the car. Okay. I only listen to CC Top uh, in my car, for some reason. <laughs> okay. it's, it's good car music. Yeah. It, it fits to that specific that, situation. It makes me hit the pedal harder. <laughs> <laughs> so you will get speeding tickets. <laughs> well, that has happened. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that like most of these shows have been sold out and you are doing like really well everywhere. So do you feel that, that actually that Lord of, of Chaos movie has affected that somehow? Uh, you know, when the whole thing, first of all, we were kind of uh, hesitant towards the whole thing. Yeah, I read your statement about it yeah, because, <laughs> that you, you gave. Yeah, you know, just get this prompt call and say, hey, you're making a movie out of your band. Uh, what do you think about it? It's like, huh? Fuck off. Especially since it didn't 
even bother to ask us anything and they're gonna base the book on a uh, the film on the book which is just completely nonsense yeah, yeah, yeah. then I was then I got worried <laughs> not worried like that I was a bit slandered or something but I worried that somebody would falsify the story and make money on it as well and then I saw that they even had printed pictures of my dead friend in the book I tried to sue the whole fucking book too so so with that in mind I just told everybody fuck off when this project came along. And then there were some forces uh, trying to get me and uh, Auckland to meet. I was in LA two times without meeting him. He was there, but I was doing accounting for the tour and stuff, so I didn't have time. But I was uh, on another tour. So it turns out the guy is a good guy. And uh, we uh, started to talk about several things and I said to him that uh, okay you want something to make this film more authentic and you need some photos maybe some music and shit like that but I must see the uh, pre movie first before I can okay anything because you know I met you a couple of times but can you I, I mean I don't trust people yeah. I, I'm a paranoid I wouldn't guy. trust it myself either Exactly. Yeah. So, but when I saw the trailer or the pre-movie, I was thinking to myself, and it, what I had in mind that the producer had said this movie is coming out anyway, and the parts where they needed a little bit music, they would just came up with something similar, and so it wouldn't change anything except little bit quality in the movie yeah, yeah, yeah. and then I was thinking to myself these people are good people they come up to me now they send me the pre thing and and uh, if we just give them a little bit then that would make the movie a little bit more quality worthy yeah, yeah, yeah. then why not plus I get a little check on the side yeah, yeah. For, for the help so, um, so then the movie came out, and uh, first of all, all the journalists in the world, Daily News, uh, LA, LA News, uh, the Sh- not the speaker, but CNN, BBC, ABC, NRK, SVT, DR, everybody, RTE, everybody wanted me to have a comment, yeah, yeah. and I told them all. I gladly comment this movie after it come out yeah. because I want people to make up their own mind about this movie. First of all, I don't know anything about movies. I like movies, but I don't know anything about making movies. Yeah. So I don't know what's really good quality and what's not. And I'm not keeping up to date with the uh, new technology or anything. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, I was curious about the actors that was going to play us. Uh, in the movie to see if they had used some um, time and had some effort into their characters and the first thing that hits me is that they actually were they did a good job on the wardrobe so uh, and everything around is made so back in a time tunnel back to 1990 because it's all the posters on the wall in the Helvete shop and okay. the, the, all the t-shirts we're wearing, all the patches and everything. It's spot on. Okay. It's the same. So uh, that first that gave me a little shock. And, uh, and they had taken a lot of histori- historical uh, things that we all know from court papers, from newspapers, from interviews. Like, for example, when Vikernes drove in his mother's uh, Volkswagen over the mountain and uh, and Snorri was driving while he was under a blanket in the, in the back seat. You know, some of these details he put forward in the movie. So was it emotional for you to see it? Yeah, 
because obviously you yeah. you have lost your friends during that time yeah. and that's yeah yeah no yeah it, uh, I dreaded it uh, it wasn't a good thing yeah uh, you know and to be so when I saw it uh, in pre pre before I saw it Jonas had told me that he had studied the autopsy report on both killings and that he had reconstructed the killings stab okay. by stab okay because you can see you can read from the autopsy yeah, yeah. where the first stab was in and then you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when that when knowing that and when i saw that then it was a slowed down scene it wasn't like really quick they drew out the scene both scenes were drawn out a little bit yeah and it made me sick to, to watch I, I mean i felt sick to my stomach when i yeah, watched yeah, that yeah. I and imagine. i felt like and afterwards i felt like completely empty inside and 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 really like down and like fuck so yeah, it, hit, so it really hit me actually. I didn't want to talk to anybody the rest of that day. That's for sure. So, but then some weeks later, no journalist, all these journalists that was going to call me, they never called me. Okay. And I thought to myself, well, maybe they saw the film and had the same reaction that, that, that I had, that this is a very fucking sad movie about something really bad that happened to some cool people that played in the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's it. Yeah, 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 basically, that's what it was. So hey, thank you a lot for your time to do this You're interview cool. with me, and and all the best for the future. Anything you want to say as last words to the Finnish fans? Yeah, the normal thing would be to come down to see us here at uh, Tavas. Yeah, but uh, it's sold out. So next time. You better set us up in a better club. Yeah, I saw next time. I mean, sorry, bigger club, because <laughs> Tavasta is all right. Thank you. You're welcome.